I haven't voted yet. Neither has our next guest, but we're going to do it within the next hour or so. Uh, although Florida is pivotal in the upcoming presidential race, the state's primary today is anticipated to be relatively low key. Joining me to discuss the important local and state races that will be decided with some possible surprises and what to expect in November is political expert and former co-worker of mine, John Daigle. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning, Dan. It's a big day. It is a big day, and there's a lot of races. I've been looking at the ballot. Um, uh, it is very partisan in many cases, but there's some uh, nonpartisan races here in St. John's County, and I mean in Duval County, and then St. John's County is is a hotbed in some places. <laughs> it is. So let's talk about the only statewide race on the ballot. That's U.S. Senate seat, and that's held right now by Rick Scott, former governor. And he faces two Republican challengers, Keith Gross and John Columbus. Admittedly, as the sit-at-home TV uh, viewer that I am, I've only seen an occasional Rick Scott uh, ad. So uh, let's let's take that into a snapshot. Yeah, I mean, that, that actually, the race on for the U.S. Senate on, on both the, the Republican and Democratic side are not going to be that exciting. I think both, uh, everybody knows kind of how, where that race is going in terms of it probably will be more exciting in November, but for the August primary, we, we kind of know uh, Scott's going to emerge and we kind of know who his opponent's going to be in November. Well, who is Scott for those who don't know and why is he so strong with the other against the other two? Well, of course, Rick Scott, former governor of Florida. He's been, he's been a leader in the U S Senate for a while. Um, the interesting thing about, Scott is his the race he's won uh, several races in Florida, but he, a lot of his races that he's won have been extremely close. Um, and and uh, Scott's never really won in a blowout, uh, whereas there's not much uh, expectation that the primary uh, today will will be a challenge for him. Uh, November could be a different story. His races, uh, as opposed to like a DeSantis, who's been winning races decisively, uh, Scott's never won in, in a blowout. So I think um, with what's happening in Florida, with the amendments that are on the ballot, with momentum shifting a little bit towards the Democrats, with now Harris on the ticket, uh, I think uh, the November race, uh, Scott could have a race on his hands in November. And that November race is going to be against U.S. Rep. Debbie McCarcel Powell, elected to Congress in 2018 as the first Ecuadorian American and first South American born woman to be elected to Congress, losing her seat after one term. But she's back in the running against, uh, again, admittedly, an extremely well-known name. So let's look ahead uh, to November in that race and who the presumed victor today yeah. is going to go against. And that's true. And McCarcel Powell does have a race. She, like you said, she is presumed that, that she and Rick Scott will emerge today fairly easily for a, uh, a pretty dynamic race uh, in November. Uh, normally, uh, the safe money would be on Rick Scott in Florida, a, a, a traditionally, at least the last 10, 12 years, a, a reliably red state. However, like I said, uh, McCarshall Powell might not be the strongest candidate against Rick Scott, but with the other dynamics that are happening in November, with uh, a lot of young voters and female voters coming out because of Harris, because of uh, the abortion amendment, because of the recreational marijuana amendment, that could give a, a lot of wind at McCarshall Powell's back. And those voters who are coming out for other reasons could be huge help for her uh, against Rick Scott, who, like I said, has not ever been winning races by overwhelming margins. Most of his races have been won by 1% or less. He won by 10,000 votes against Nelson uh, in the last race. So um, so I think that could be an exciting race to watch in November. And of course, McCarcel Powell does have some competition herself. She has uh, Rod Joseph and Brian Rush, and Rush is a former uh, four-term state representative. Uh, any competition, any concerns there, any numbers that might cause a runoff? No, I mean, we don't hear much about that race because most of the attention has been focused uh, south of uh, the I-4 corridor. But um, but the, the if you look at the money and you look at the things that, that pr usually predict a victory, uh, all signs point to the fact that McCarcel Powell will emerge today pretty easily. Okay, if you are just joining us, we're talking to political expert John Daigle about key races to look for tonight, because today is Florida's primary day. As those election results filter in, you can join the conversation live on air by calling 904-549-2937. You can email First Coast Connect at wjct.org or reach out on social media. If you're still up in the air about who to vote for, be sure to check out our nonpartisan voter guides at jackstoday.org. 
We've also interviewed many of the candidates on this program, and those segments can be found on YouTube. Just search WJCT or First Coast Connect on the YouTube landing page. Well, yesterday, our guest speaker was uh, the guy in charge of uh, Duval County's elections, uh, supervisor, um, and, and Jerry talked about uh, the turnout. What do you think the turnout is today, and, and uh, who's going to jump? Which party is going to jump out there? Yeah, I, I heard your interview with, with Jerry Holland. I'm a big Jerry Holland fan. I think he's done a fantastic job over there. Uh, and Jerry did talk about the fact that right now we're looking at what would be a traditionally fairly low turnout, a little bit over 11 percent. Uh, for the early and absentee voters. Uh, if you look at the numbers, our ma- uh, uh, vote by mail numbers are, are significantly down from what they have been over the last two or three cycles. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Republican Party has, uh, you know, at, at times in recent years discouraged or, or disparaged vote by mail. And, and uh, the question is whether those Republicans who used to vote by mail, whether they'll show up today and make up for, you know, what appears to be a lackluster turnout. Uh, right now, traditionally, about half the voters will, will vote either by mail or, at, um, or early voting. And then the other half usually turn up on Election Day. If that model holds true, then we're looking at, you know, about a 23, 22 percent turnout, which would be pretty low for an August primary. If um, if there are Republicans who who used to vote by mail show up on Election Day, then we could be looking at uh, 25, 26 percent turnout, which would be about average. Yeah, Jerry Holland had indicated he thought it was going to be a pretty crowded Election Day in November that uh, you might get there in fine lines. Yeah, election uh, November will be a whole different story. And I, you know, I've talked to people a lot who try to make inferences about what's going to happen in November based on August. And I've always preached that. The elections are so different. Uh, the, the voters who turn out, the demographics, uh, the geographics, uh, it's really hard to try to, to, to make uh, to try to make deductions about what's going to happen in November based on what we see today. Uh, there is uh, on our ballot in Florida in November, there's going to be things in there that will bring out young voters, that will bring out uh, minority voters, uh, that will bring out Democrats. There's just not much on the ballot today. If you're a Democrat in Duval County or Clay or St. John's, there's very little on the ballot that can motivate you you to get there. Uh, That won't be the case in November. See, the interesting thing that I and I wrote about this last week, I had never heard of a state committee man and state committee woman uh, running. Maybe it was just one of those uh, things I just never noticed. Uh, But there's some powerhouses running (laughs) for the inner workings of the Duval Republican club yeah. uh, party, I, I should say. Um, and, and literally a street corner near me is filled with those powerhouse names. Oh yeah. I mean, I've seen those, those street signs too. And that's the unusual thing. I mean, those committee members have had to run before, but for whatever, and for whatever reason, um, they're running as if they're running in a competitive state race. I don't know. I'm not a, an inside party guy enough to understand why those races have suddenly taken on a higher profile or they feel the need, you know, uh, for to, to do yard signs or commercial signs all over the city to, to win a um, state party committee person seat. But uh, but I, I've seen that same phenomenon you have. Uh, maybe it's because parties do actually exercise some power out there and selecting the inner processes uh, is something that. They want to work on. Well, let's talk about some of the other key races in Northeast Florida. And again, sure. as that person watching the six o'clock news every night, uh, there's one or two in St. John's County that are way up there. Uh, and, and not only just the candidates, but the PACs. So yeah, tell St. me John's, about Northeast Florida. Right now, it, watching elections in, in our corner of the state, St. John's County is, is where the, the really excitement is. There's some very uh, heated, contested uh, county commission race down there and St. John's County, which has been one of the fastest growing counties in the state for a long, long time. It is for the, probably the first time seeing serious debate going on about slowing the growth versus keeping the party go, uh, going down there. You've got a slate of candidates who are essentially are running, uh, on the platform of slowing down the growth versus some establishment candidates that are kind of running as a slate that are highly backed by developers uh, and and uh, and builders in that area. That is sort of the backdrop for some of the really high profile races. You 
you've got you've got a, a contested sheriff's race down there, and you've also got this very uh, competitive race to fill uh, former Senator Travis Hudson's uh, Senate District Seven seat. That race between Leak and Shore has turned into proxy fights on a number of different levels. I mean, it's essentially a proxy fight between DeSantis Republicans and Trump Republicans, with uh, with Shore having the Trump support. It's also kind of a proxy fight between the insurance industry and trial lawyers. Um, the leak has, is heavily supported by the insurance industry where he works. And um, and then Shore, of course, has got backing for, uh, from this Truth Matters PAC, which is heavily funded by trial lawyers. And that is a really important battle right now in Florida because it, insurance is obviously a major issue in Florida, homeowners insurance. And we expect that in Tallahassee, uh, the next session is going to be pretty well dominated by fights over how to uh, get a handle on the problems we have in Florida over the insurance industry. What gets me the most is how angry the television ads are, how yeah. forceful, how they're making claims. And, and part of me wants to dive into the Internet and find out if it's true or not. Yeah. Do a fact check. And the other half is oh, that's just some pack doing their usual attack. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, this is unfortunately sort of the part of the problem with the dark money laws. I mean, it, really, uh, I'm a huge advocate for some kind of reforms that, to get a control over how dark money is used in, in increasingly in, in local, hyper-local races. I mean, we used to see dark money used at, at the highest levels in the state and national, but but the PAC money and, and you know, untraceable money that gets traded back and forth between three or four PACs before it's finally spent. It's it's really, I, I've actually worked with a few reporters who've been trying to track what's going on down in St. John's County right now, and it's almost impossible to track money back to its source uh, because of the way uh, the, the PACs fund each other and then finally p end up paying for um, for political ads or whatever activities. It's uh, St. John's County is, is a case study right now in why uh, we really should reform the way that PAC money can be spent in local races. You know, as, as a current reporter who has covered some of the issues that are in the shore attack ads, um, I can tell you that there is some truth to one or two of the claims, but it's not the whole story. Yeah. Um, and I won't go any deeper than that. I also seem to have a memory when I did political advertising in a brief period as a public relations person, that if the ad was from the candidate, that candidate had to be there in audio. I'm John Smith. I approve this ad. Well, if you're and you're right, if it is a campaign candidate paid ad, there has to be a disclosure, not on the local, as you know, federal levels, the candidate has to actually make that disclaimer in his in his or her voice. Uh, in other races, you have disclaimers that are required as text at the end of TV ads. But uh, but the problem is that's not the same when and it comes into money and ads placed by these political committees. Right. Cause and, it's and not act. the candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, so, and, and again, it's really hard sometimes to trace where that money is coming from because it is funneled through two or three different packs before it actually used to place ads. Well, uh, my spouse and I are both uh, going to be happy come tomorrow when, <laughs> when that noise ends, because, uh, a, it's not my County yeah. to worry about and B it's, um, it, the attack ads are, are, are a little distasteful. Well, you you may have a few days to enjoy that before we start getting ads for no, the November races. Okay. <laughs> Speaking about other races, we've got Angie Nixon and Brenda Priestley Jackson in the Florida House District 13 race. And uh, um, uh, a little softball thrown into that last week with the lawsuit by former Congresswoman Corinne Brown. Uh, so let's talk about that race and, and the fact that as Democrats, they're both uh, uh, aiming at each other. Sure. I mean, yeah, and that's probably one of the most exciting races in, in the Duval area. Uh, we have some school board races. We have some judge races that, that are pretty interesting and important. Uh, in terms of state races in, in our neck of the woods here in Duval, that race uh, promises to be one of the most uh, compelling to watch today. Uh, Angie Nixon is a fierce um, retail politician. She is uh, very strong in terms of her ground game. Um, in Tallahassee, though, she has, uh, she's been kind of a thorn in the side of the Republicans get control of Tallahassee. Uh, she's been very vocal on some major statewide issues. The, the knock on her that Brenda Priestley Jackson has made throughout her campaign 
is that Angie Nixon has spent too much time focusing on statewide issues and fighting uh, leadership in Tallahassee and not enough time on district level issues and bringing um, resources back to her district. Uh, that would be a compelling argument. Uh, J- Priestley Jackson has not run a, a uh, really effective campaign, not at least not enough to kind of counter the, the really strong campaign work that Angie Nixon is known for and that she's done. Um, uh, Angie is probably in line. You know, she is, she's definitely, if she wins this election, as I expect her to do, I think uh, she is in a position to, to really emerge as a statewide leader on the Democratic side. So was there any impact from the lawsuit that was filed last week by the former congresswoman regarding the fake mailer and and the fake Kareen picks? Uh, I mean, it was it was good news coverage for a couple of days. It did kind of help remind some voters of who Corinne uh, was supporting and who she wasn't. I kind of wrote it off as as a nice little campaign drama, but in the long run should not have a major impact on the outcome of that race. Hey, another race is Becky Nathanson, District 3, against incumbent Cindy Pearson. Um, just a little background on that one and where we're going into today. Yeah, again, two Republicans running in a nonpartisan race against each other. I mean, that that kind of is indicative of we've got four school board races going on right now. Mm-hmm. And at a really pivotal time in the Duval County School Board, we have a brand new superintendent. And these four races really will decide, you know, what, what type of philosophy controls the majority of that school board going forward as we enter this whole new era under our new superintendent. Uh, the Nathanson uh, Pearson race is, is really, you know, a race about the, uh, the newer sort of moms for Liberty type of Republicans versus more traditional Republicans that Cin- uh, Cindy Pearson um, ha- is mounting. And I'll full disclosure, I'm, I ran Cindy's first campaign and I'm, and I'm, supporter of her, so I don't want to get too far into that race. Uh, but she has brought on some kind of traditional Republican support, like former Mayor Payton and some other high-profile names like Matt Carlucci. So it, it really is an interesting battle that kind of uh, exemplifies or, or, or highlights sort of the differences, the inter-party differences on the Republican side right now. In case you're just listening, we're talking to uh, John Daigle, who is a well-known political consultant locally and a, a common guest and often guest on First Coast Connect. And we're talking about today's Florida primary, which you may or may not know, despite all the signs out there, is happening as we speak. Uh, going to school board, there is uh, Reggie Blunt uh, in District 5 against Nashawn Nix and Hank Rogers. Uh, thoughts about that school board race? Yeah, that's probably the only school board race that, that has a pretty good chance of pushing to November. Um, it, it, again, it's another race where you have uh, sort of moms for liberty type candidates running against traditional Republicans. Uh, it, it uh, in all likelihood, because of the fact that there's there's multiple candidates in that race and no one has really blown it out, uh, most likely pushes to a November runoff. And then District 7 School Board, Melody Bolduc against Sarah Mannion. Again, another Bolduc, a Moms for Liberty candidate versus Mannion, a, a more of a traditional candidate. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. To me, I'm looking at that race to kind of see in an, in an August primary, you would expect that that faction of the Republican Party that that supports you know, the Moms for Liberty, the Ron DeSantis, that faction uh, will will do much better than they would in November. So, uh, and, you know, I, I would not I think in this environment, in the August primary environment, it's a really good environment for those Moms for Liberty candidates. Now, we've talked about St. John's County, but uh, uh, let's just go back to the slow growth race, uh, the Hudson Gate candidates, just to 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 refresh people that's on the ballot. Uh, we did see an issue some months ago on the commission where there was some serious griping about a project in Ponte Vedra that was going to basically go a little opposite what we used to see, which was slow growth, lots of, uh, you know, uh, land around projects. And it ended up in a little bit of legal action against an incumbent Um where do we stand on that again? Yeah, as I said, I, I'm a St. John's County resident. I've lived there for, for over 25 years, grew up uh, in this area. But um, but uh, this is the first time I've ever, you know, there's always been a little bit of a, of a pushback on the rapid growth. St. John's County is growing at an amazing rate, and it has for many, many years. And there's been a, small voices about controlling the growth and slowing it down, but there's never been the kind of energy that there seems to be right now about a, a, a organized effort 
to say, uh, let's, let's slow the growth uh, a little bit. Uh, what's, I found it really interesting on the other side of that sentiment, the, the three candidates who are considered the pro-growth candidates um, actually running as a slate. They, I, I don't know that I've ever seen three county commission candidates run a commercial together that all three paid for. The disclaimer had all three of their campaign endorse, uh, disclaimers on it. Uh, which was pretty unusual, but it, it does definitely signal what's happening in St. John's County, which is a very clear slate of candidates that that is for, you know, continuing the party down there and others that say it's time to uh, to for some some new way of thinking about controlling growth. You know, the old saw used to be that St. John's County never had an industry that could be a, a financial base for making money other than tourism. But yet, if you drive along the St. Augustine area stretch of 95, you are seeing huge project after project yeah. after project being built around 16, around uh, the, the, the major uh, into St. Augustine exits. And to me, that's a lot of growth. And then obviously the development in Ponte Vedra uh, versus uh, World Golf Village, which now is a county owned property and has a yeah. hotel and a restaurant and a church. That's it. Um, yeah, I mean, you're seeing signs of what exactly what you're saying. And when you see big hospitals like Ascension and Baptist and, and Humana and others, you see them building large campuses down there. Like you said, it's always kind of been a bedroom community. And, you know, you've got the tourism industry around St. Augustine. You've got, you know, the wealthy neighborhoods in Ponte Vedra, but you haven't had industry down there. And, and over the last five years, you're seeing major Jacksonville companies, you know, open up you know, campuses in that. So it is definitely becoming a lot less of a bedroom community and a lot more of its own uh, uh, community itself with its own business base. Of course, if you have your bedroom there in your $300,000 house, you (laughs) want a hospital nearby, you want a good shopping center, you want an office center where you might eventually work. So the development is going to support all of those communities that have been coming in. I mean, take a look at North, at the Fruit Cove area. Yeah. That is wall to wall now development. I can remember when there was a bar at the corner of Fruit Cove Road <laughs> and 13 and that was it. And because I am that old. Let's talk about that circuit court judge race. I will tell you that one of those candidates, Mothers, was out handing out campaign material at car shows months ago. Yeah. And it's a judge's race. I ran a judge's race and advertising campaign. Uh, you're limited in what you can say in a judge's race. You can only say A, B, and C. Mm-hmm. But obviously, there's a big push in a judge's race. Yeah. Well, that you're right. Traditionally, the uh, Florida Bar has really controlled what judge, judicial candidates can and can't say. One of the big changes in the last uh, few years has been that they that through some court battles, they are now allowing a judicial candidates to use the word conservative, and and that's really playing out in that race between. Um, Nancy Cleveland, Nancy, Ashley Cleveland. Wells Cox. Yes. Yeah. And Cleveland has really. Um, picked up on the fact that she can now go out as a judicial candidate and tout being the conservative candidate in that race. And that's sort of really drawn the line in that, in that um, race. Cleveland is running to the far right at, at touting her uh, position as the conservative in the race. And in August, that's not a bad strategy. I'm not sure, you know, again, if this race were in November, whether that would be the right way to go. But for this particular voting population, Cleveland is, is smart to kind of tout that. But yet that's a nonpartisan race. And there have been some comments that pushing conservative is implying Republican, which makes her not nonpartisan. I mean, that you can make that argument. It, 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 you know, as again, as as the bar has affirmed, it's Cleveland can now go out and say that she's a conservative. And if people want to infer that that means she's the Republican in the race, you know, that I'm, I'm sure that's part of the strategy. But like I said, in, in an August primary in Duval County, that's not a bad place to be. Okay. With a few minutes left here with you, John, uh, any surprises or insights that today's primary might uh, give us as we go toward November? Yeah. I mean, I certainly, as we talked about, I'm certainly watching the way that the four school board races go. I think that's going to be really important. We're at a really pivotal time in education in Duval County. And, uh, and I think those four races could have a huge say on, on the makeup of that board over the next few years. So I think those races are, are hugely important. Uh, aside from that, you know, personally, I, I'm a political junkie, so I'm I'm watching the circuit judge race. I've got a candidate in the county judge race, so I'm obviously watching that one very closely as well. 
Yeah, I, uh, I actually had a county judge race, too, back in my past, and we'll just leave it at that. Now, um, what about the false flag operations by these uh, these PACs? Um, certainly, we've talked about it with, the, with, with some of the St. John's County, but is there any other PAC uh, that's, that's uh, being visible or working their way through some of the races here? That's a trend that we're starting to see more and more lately in primary elections where one party tries to get involved in the outcome um, of of what happens in the other party's primary. We saw it here locally in the last sheriff's race. We saw the, the Waters team getting involved in the primary, really kind of trying to push Jefferson over Burton. They actively worked to, to help Jefferson out because they preferred to face him in the general. Uh, we saw it uh, statewide uh, happening in the Christ race last time where the Republicans got involved in that primary. And I think we are seeing it uh, in, in, I think that is part of the dynamic in that League Shore race where trial lawyers who are traditionally on the Democratic side uh, have gotten very heavily involved in what is essentially a Republican primary uh, and trying to, you know, basically say that their, the candidate they want to win is more conservative. So I think we'll see more of that uh, as, as time goes on. And I guess the final question is the elephant in the room, no pun intended, is obviously we're in the middle of a presidential race. So what are you thinking about uh, with with uh, the Trump versus uh, Vice President Harris? It certainly will create a, a very different dynamic for November. I'm not sure it has much effect on, on today's August primary, but uh, it will bring new energy. It will bring new voters to November. There is discussion. I'm not taking it seriously yet, but there's discussion about Florida possibly being in play got a long time to go. 77 days is a lifetime in politics. So there's a, there's a lot of politics to play out. But I think um, I think Florida's election, because of what's happened at the Democratic ticket, Florida's election will be a lot more interesting than it would have been. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you, I could not stay up last night that late to watch the president speak. I did catch some of uh, Secretary Clinton. Uh, I think they're going to have to prime time this stuff so <laughs> that uh, we can watch this if we so choose to. Uh, and then obviously we've got a debate or two coming up, yeah. a presidential, a vice presidential. And, you know, I'm going to watch those. Yeah, There's, there is new life. So. All right. John Daigle, we have talked politics, local, state and uh, and national with you. Great to have you here. 